unless they change some stuff, you're unlikely to get the full amount. And if you are around that age, you probably won't get it for long. Welcome to Money in the Bank with Frank. Remember, Money in the Bank with Frank and related podcasts are provided for general information purposes only. Do not constitute accounting, legal, tax, or other professional advice. The information contained here is for educational purposes only, and I may or may not own securities and companies discussed in the pod. Visitors should not act upon content or information found here without first seeking appropriate advice from an accountant, financial planner, lawyer, or other professional. Again, let's get to it. Saving for retirement can seem daunting, especially when you have no idea where to start. Popular guide is the 4% rule. You can determine how much you can comfortably spend each year from your retirement savings and can actually provide some clues for how much money you'll need to retire and what you're gonna need to get there. The uh, definition of the word to retire is actually to remove yourself from a situation. And I think we could all agree that sometimes that's a great place to be. But in reality, retiring is actually being able to make a better decision about what you want to do when you grow up and having the means to do it. It's not about leaving the workforce altogether. It's about starting a new chapter and how you can put a monetary value behind that. So simply put, the 4% rule is a great place to start thinking about retirement savings. And here are some things that you need to know. First, what is the 4% rule? Well, it, say, it simply states that you should be able to comfortably live off about 4% of your money in investments in the first year of retirement, then slightly increase or decrease that amount to account for inflation. But subsequent years, based on historical data, living off of 4% will allow you to use your retirement portfolio to cover expenses for 30 years. Now, keep in mind that that's not necessarily the case right now. As we all know, inflation is running fairly rampant. Uh, I've got a tweet from Sarah Eisen who talks a little bit about, that was talking with Carl Cantania and it shows where we are versus where we were. Now, granted, it seems that uh, inflation is starting to cool off. We have all these different commodities, food, fuel, cocoa, so on and so forth. And you're seeing this negative print. You're seeing now versus their year to date highs. But the one thing that we haven't seen lately just yet is that translating back to less expensive food when you go out to eat, less expensive fuel from where people are used to. So this year may be a little different and the 4% may, rule may not exactly apply. But in general, over the history, that's, that's the 4% rule. And it became popular in the mid 1990s. And uh, research found that if you withdrew 4% a year during retirement, there would actually be a high probability that your money would outlast you in retirement. But recently, some financial planners have reevaluated that 4% practice due to the possibility of lower social security distributions in the future and the concern that retirees will need to make uh, their, their savings last a little longer. Now, that being said, social security in the past couple of years has been helpful. It actually has had a, a marked uh, move upwards which has been really helpful for people that are in a fixed income situation. As a result, many financial planners believe now that 3.3% may actually be a more comfortable amount to withdraw each year, not for lower 3.3. Anytime something gets popular, obviously we ruin it. And that's so the case with pretty much everything because the 4% rule is so popular, it's been challenged for decades because it's such a widely used measure that people wanna make sure it's still accurate and relevant. The argument for why that number should be higher or lower depends on the environment you're in, uh, the environment of the future market and the future economy, how long we live, also has a huge impact on how much we'll need. In addition, where you live, it's gonna be different if you're in the Northeast where prices are higher or on the West Coast where prices are higher. If you're in the middle, taxes are lower, cost of living is a little lower. So there may be some different things depending on where you're gonna be. Maybe you downsize your house, but as a result, there are definitely arguments that we should be withdrawing less each year because we're living longer and we just need more. Now, it's important to note that this is a rule of thumb number, right? Now, when I do a financial plan and I actually do 
a long financial plan for most of my clients. And every time I give it to them, I literally write on the front, this is a lie. And that's because you can't plan for everything, but knowing a plan will get you there better than not knowing a plan. So it's a rule of thumb, the 4% rule and the updated 3.3. It's not explicitly how to save for it, but having an idea of how much money you're gonna spend in your non-working years and how it can help you work backwards to figure out how much you're gonna to need to have saved up in the first place. Now, how do you work backwards using that 4% rule? There's a quote that says that you should begin with the end in mind. So you should determine how much you're going to need to spend each year in retirement and use that 4% rule to figure out how much money you'll need to last throughout your retirement. And if you've ever sat down and just done a, a small budget, just, and I try to get, I emphasize, I try to get all of my new clients to just write a budget out. Tell me how much you're paying for rent. Tell me how much you're paying for insurance. Tell me how much you're paying for food, for fuel. And that'll give you a rough idea of how much you're spending now. Now then you're gonna have to adjust that if you're not driving as much, if you're driving back and forth to work and it's a fairly long commute, maybe you're gonna have to adjust that. So to do this, you should consider following uh, cost as a jumping off point. So you've got your rent or your mortgage, you've got your healthcare and long-term care costs, you've got annual cost of groceries, cost of medication, huge cost by the way, cost of medication through the roof, funny little tidbit, most of these medications actually have gone down in cost or price but our costs are going up, but we'll get to that in a different episode. Transportation costs, whether that's your car payment and maintenance or public transportation expenses. And then big one, amount you plan to spend on travel each year. Everyone thinks I'm gonna travel all the time. Well, I'll just tell you this, once you start traveling a little bit, it tends to get old, changing the time, not sleeping in your own bed, not as comfortable. So yeah, you will probably travel quite a bit in the beginning part of, of retirement, but as that goes on, you tend to calm those, uh, those travel expenses down quite a bit. Pet expenses, those aren't cheap because we all know that we take care of our pets as if they were our children. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. Everyone has uh, different expenses and especially when you consider what type of lifestyle you want in retirement. But you can think of those categories as a way to begin thinking about the costs that you're gonna need and what's gonna be covered in retirement. And anything that like isn't on the sheet, anything that you're doing research and it's like, oh, I didn't account for this. I have jewelry, I have art, I like this, I like that. Wine collections, you have to budget that in as well. And one cost that you really should not underestimate is healthcare. Most people are concerned about their expenses regarding healthcare. So it's really important to understand that the premium costs and the out-of-pocket costs of healthcare and retirement. And alongside this, people are really concerned about long-term care costs for when they can't care for themselves. It can get really expensive if not managed right. And unfortunately, a lot of the insurance companies have cut off a lot of different, uh, a lot of these different riders for long-term care or disability. So factor those in as well. Once you add up all those potential costs per year, you also have to account for some discretionary spending, which to me, makes me happy. Discretionary spending is good, right? Money for any other expenses that may pop up. This could mean tackling on another $5,000 to the total that you just calculated. Let's say you estimated your potential annual spend will be 40,000 with an additional five grand as a cushion. So you'll be spending 45,000 a year in retirement. Next, you have to consider approximately how much of that money you're going to be receiving through benefits like social security, or if you're lucky, enough to have a pension or defined benefit plan. Social Security has an online benefits calculator that's really helpful. It lets you average or estimate how much you might be receiving in Social Security based on your income and when you hope to retire. So let's say you expect to receive about 20,000 a year through Social Security. This means that instead of withdrawing 45 grand from your retirement savings, you're only gonna need the difference between that 45 grand and the 20 grand that you're gonna get from Social Security. So that's like, 25 grand. If it still exists when you get to retirement age, that is, keep in mind that it's expected to run out of funds in 2037. So that's 16 years from now. So if you're under 49 years old, unless they change some stuff, you're unlikely to get the full amount. And if you are around that age, you probably won't get it for long unless something is done about the social security system. Now that you know how much money you'll need to come out of your retirement each year, you can use that 4% rule to figure out the total amount that you'll need to have saved up before you reach that early retirement. Simply take 25,000 and divide it by 0.04, 4%, and that'll get you $625,000. So in other words, 
625,000 is gonna last you 30 years if you only withdraw $25,000 a year, which is 4%. And if you wanna go by the updated 3.3% rule, you'll divide 25 grand by 0.033, that gets you $757,575. So how can you start saving now? Knowing how much money you'll need to have saved up before you re enter retirement can help you get a good idea of how much money you should be putting away right now in order to reach that goal. Once you use those above steps to calculate that number, then you can go to an investor calculator. You can go to like investor.org, bankrate.com. Any of these savings goal calculators will help you. So let's say you want to save for $625,000 for retirement and you have $1,000 in savings. If you're currently 30 and you want to retire at 65, then you have 35 years to invest your money before you start making withdrawals. If you decide to make fairly aggressive investments in index funds and stocks, maybe not right now, <laughs> which is going to yield you an approximate annual income of 9%, then according to a savings calculator, you're going to need $233.56 each month for 35 years to make that $625,000. And keep in mind that that 9% figure, it's not a complete uphill battle, like as, as a lot of people have seen today or this year, uh, if you had that $625,000 and it was in the market uh, and you were super close to retirement and you just lost 30%, you're not there. So you have to keep that in mind. It's not going to be 9% a year. It's not a guarantee. So you, you have to invest diligently. Hopefully you have a seven year time horizon. And in that case, then you can invest hopefully in equities, but you can follow these same steps for any retirement goal, for any rate of return, any length of time. Once you know how much you need to save, uh, it's going to be time to start putting that into practice. There's so many different retirement savings vehicles out there. And in fact, you may be using one through your employer, which is like a 401k. If you are uh, self-employed, you actually have so many if different options. You've got SEP IRAs, simplified employee pension plans. You've got regular IRAs, you've got Roth IRAs. With your firm, if you have a 401k, you might have a Roth 401k, which is great. Those Roth 401ks allow you to withdraw money without paying any tax at all. With a 401k, you can set up your account so a percentage of your paycheck is automatically invested for you each pay period. I like to think of this as paying yourself first. And since the money is being invested, it's pre-tax, you'll owe taxes on that amount when you, when you pull it out of retirement because it's never been taxed and the IRS wants their money, right? A traditional IRA works the same way, except it's not company sponsored. So you're going to have to set up the account yourself. And you can do this at any of the discount brokerage firms. You can do it at your bank. With these pre-tax savings vehicles, you'll also want to account for paying taxes on your withdrawal in retirement. It's best to speak with a financial advisor or tax pro for specifics as they pertain to you. If you don't have one, feel free to give me a call. However, if you've been saving money through a post-retirement account, like a Roth IRA or Roth 401k, you won't need to account for taxes when you make withdrawals in retirement. With these accounts, you're investing post-tax money, and that's money that's already, already been taxed. You didn't take a deduction from it. So those contributions are gonna continue to grow over the years, and you won't, any taxes, you won't owe any taxes on the withdrawals. Not all companies offer these options to invest in a Roth 401k. However, anyone can open up a Roth IRA simply by creating an account through a brokerage company. It takes a few minutes to create, and fund your account with a linked bank account. And once you've uh, opened and, and fund your account, you'll need to pick your investments. Keep in mind, not everybody qualifies to do a Roth, but if you do, do it. Bottom line is thinking ahead to what your life might look like in retirement, it might actually encourage you to start taking small steps that can have a huge impact over time. That 4% rule is a popular estimate for how much money you'll need to save to last you 30 years in retirement. But whether you choose to follow that 3.3% or the 4% traditional rule of thumb, figuring out your retirement number is only part of the work. You also need to know how much money to start saving right now to reach that goal, which can be done through the use of online calculators, 
But once you're ready to really dive into some specifics, you're probably going to want to seek the assistance from a financial advisor. Again, as I've mentioned, CFP.net, which is a certified financial planning board, CFP.net, putting in your zip code is going to help you find a certified financial planner in your area. Go check them out, talk to different people, see if you get along and move forward. Again, thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, checking out the show. Uh, check out some more episodes of Money in the Bank with Frank and some of the other episodes on the station. Have a great night. Thanks for watching. If you like this content, you can find me on Money in the Bank with Frank on all of your favorite podcast platforms, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on our YouTube channel. Look forward to bringing you more content like this in the future. Thanks.